A very good evening and warm welcome to Dan Really Likes Wine, presented by Pig and Pay. Thank you for joining me as we kick off the wine week with a couple of proper rock stars from the wine world. Some really great wine, wine that sells out enormously quickly, and wine with great, great stories behind it, especially some of the labels. We'll get straight into those in just a moment. Uh, first of all, though, thank you if you've come straight over from the Strauss Art and Wine Auction Zoom session with Roland and Higo and the team at Strauss, where we looked ahead or looked at the current auction, which finishes next Monday. Also includes stuff for Golf RSA, terrific auction, some lovely, lovely wine, including wine made by one of our two guests today, which I'll reference in just a moment. And also thank you if you've entered our current competition. You're going to be seeing a few more competitions over the next little while, but the one we've got at the moment. Well, it's a cracker. It's in celebration of International Cabernet Sauvignon Day, which is this Thursday, the 3rd of October. And it's a very simple competition to enter. You need to head over to either the Dan Really Likes Wine Twitter feed or the Dan Really Likes Wine Facebook page. Make sure you are following all three estates plus Dan Really Likes Wine. And on either of those two platforms, let us know what your ideal dish would be to pair with a bottle of Cabernet Sauvignon from the Banhook Valley. Maybe it is one from Bartony, from Oldenburg, from Delair Graf. And those are important because that is your prize. The winner, a weekend away for two people in the beautiful Banhook Valley, a perfect spot to go and escape to. You'll be tasting wine at Bartony. You'll also head over to Delair Graf and to Oldenburg to do tastings there. And Michael, you're done. will bring you breakfast in bed while Rose your darn massages your feet. It's a terrific prize. And there's also a second prize of a case of wine from each of those three estates. So very simple to enter. Uh, just jump online, Twitter or Facebook. Dan really likes wine. Follow us, Oldenburg, Delegraph and Barkney, and name your favourite dish to go with a bottle of Cabernet Sauvignon. And on the show on Thursday, which will be coming to you live from Cheetah Plains in the Kruger National Park, we will announce the winner. And speaking of live, not only live at Cheetah Plains in the Kruger uh, with uh, Buck, uh, Ranger Buck Safaris, but also tomorrow, a very special edition where I will be at Marble for the official reopening David Higgs's acclaimed restaurant. Uh, the Joburg foodie Steve Steinfeld will be joining me. Uh, Vikas Schumann, a regular winner at sommelier competitions around the world. Uh, Gary Kiriaku, who is the co-owner of Marble, and a couple of other special guests tasting some wine, tasting some bubbles, because tomorrow is International Cup Classique and Champagne Day, and also seeing the restaurant get underway. But first of all, we have got wine to drink and people to meet today, and that wine comes from two places. A little later, we head into the heart of Woodstock, where Duncan Savage tells us if he's got any wine left. It is as frenzied a release as I have seen, not just this year, but in many, many years, the latest Savage wines hitting the market and disappearing very quickly indeed. So Duncan Savage will be joining us in about 20 minutes or so. Before then, though, some of the most interesting stories in South African wine come from the labels of a gentleman called Peter Volser, who makes the blank bottle range, bottles that started as being blank, but have now morphed into not just extraordinary pieces of art, but also the most remarkable stories, many of which, if not all, have got Peter Volser at their heart. So let's go straight over for our first guest and say a very good evening, Peter. Warm welcome to Dan Really Likes Wine, and thank you for joining us. Good evening. It's, it's lovely to have you here because you are not just a terrific winemaker, but you have got the most eclectic collection of stories, I think, in the history of winemaking when it comes to bringing your labels together. Before we look at the current labels and taste our current wine, though, go back to the very start and, and the blank bottle philosophy, because it was done very specifically. This wasn't just a marketing gimmick. This was based on approach you felt was really necessary for people to properly understand and drink wine without too many preconceptions. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it was never planned. It was never like a, I never had a business plan or anything like that. Um, it actually, I started selling wine when I was studying, and and um, it was always wine with no labels on. But that was just for survival to make money to pay my studies. And when I finished university, I started making wine in, in my friend's garage and sort of went on like that. And two years later, the, the the police closed me down. And they basically there was three things that I did wrong. I mean, 
I didn't, uh, we've, you've got tax on alcohol, like your excise duty that I, I've never paid at that stage. I didn't have a liquor license and I was selling wine with no labels on. So the police took all my stuff and I, and I first had to apply for a liquor license, pay all my fines and all my stuff. And then the last thing I had to do is I had to show them a label for, for the wines. And if I show them a label, they would give my wine back. And that same week, a lady came to me and she said to me that she heard from someone I sell, I sell wine and uh, she wants to buy wine, but she doesn't drink any Shiraz. So if it's like Cabernet or Merlot, she'll buy, but no Shiraz. And in my garage, I had a couple of cases that the police didn't take. It was at my house. So I grabbed a bottle of Shiraz. This was the only wine I had. I bought a glass, she loved the wine and bought a few cases. So then I was sort of, it was a combination between sort of rebelling against the system and also um, realizing that if I drink, let's say Sauvignon Blanc, if I see Sauvignon Blanc in the label and if I taste the wine, uh, before I've tasted the wine, I already make sort of my, I'll, I'll, I'll decide what I'm going to think about the wine. So I thought, I just want people not to judge my wine before they taste it. And I just, I called it blank bottle. Uh, there's no sort of, well, that was the very first wine that I've ever labeled looked like that. It just, I just went onto Microsoft Word and I wrote blank bottle on a, on a little block and I printed it out and that was the label. So uh, from the beginning, I, I love stories and I felt like these wines have stories behind them. So I took the title of the story and that became the batch name of the wine. And that was sort of the start. And it was never a serious business. It was like a sideline, almost like a joke in a sense. And uh, that was 17 years ago. So nowadays, that's sort of what I do. It's a remarkable history, uh, but it does help to explain how that history has evolved because a very clear story behind Blank Bottle. So it might have been blank, but it still had that story. Uh, we now move forward. And I'd advise you, if you get a moment, head over to the Blank Bottle website. There are 225 bottles of wine, and every single one just about has got its own label and its own story. We've got two in particular that we're going to drink. But before I go on to these two, Peter, if I can ask you a question about some of the 223 other bottles that we don't have here today, is there, outside of these two, a particular story since you first kicked off and your skirmishes with the law and beginning your uh, very eccentric and very cool approach to labelling that gives you a particular smile that you look back on with, with great fondness? Yeah, it, it, it goes through phases. So, so, so every couple of months, it's another wine that sort of makes me smile. Uh, but at the moment, there is a very particular thing that happened as an extension to a story. The wine is called Little William, and it's basically based on a story of a kid that I found in the road in the Sierras Mountains close to this vineyard that I, that I make wine of. And, uh, and that was many years ago, and I actually stumbled our paths crossed just the other day for, uh, without actually planning it. And so, yeah, so that at the moment... Little William's story is very special to me, but that's just because that there's an extension that happened now. Um, but yeah, I mean, it goes through phases. They, uh, they really, you need to set yourself a few hours aside to go and read all of these stories. Uh, we've got two of them to share with you today, and very excitedly so. I've uh, on this side here. Uh, and the first of these, uh, I was thinking, well, I know my Afrikaans is not great, and um, but I've never heard the word Hinterhof Kabuf. In Afrikaans, and I was trying to think, no, that's uh, that's clearly not Afrikaans. And I was right because, in fact, this is a German word. And although the wine is Riesling, which makes for a nice parallel, you didn't give it the German name because of the Riesling, uh, but because of a rather annoying German journalist you just couldn't get rid of. Yeah, it was the Der, Der Stern, the the Stern magazine. It's like a it's like a tabloid magazine in in Germany. Yeah, this guy, like, like I made a wine in my friend's garage and then um, on a farm, and then he had this really old building on the farm that was basically sort of half broken down, and there was one room left. So he rented me this little room, and it was really cheap. I think I paid like, like 300 rand a month for this little room. And then the, the Stern magazine came out for an interview and they, they interviewed me and then they wrote this big article about this guy living in a Hinterhofka booth. So the, the, um, when I looked it up, in, the, in, in Old Berlin, they had like the main house where the people lived. And then they had the Hinterhof, which is the back house, which the, like, a, a, like a poorer family lived. And then they had the Kabuf at the back, which basically like Hinterhof Kabuf is a backyard shack. So this guy was saying that I live in this, this backyard shack. 
and I named my office the backyard, like the Hinter Hoofkaboof. And when the Riesling came on board, I thought, okay, this sort of sort of works. <laughs> it certainly does. It's a wonderful parallel on so many levels. It's also, although a uh, German grape, a wine that I know you feel very strongly is a South African Riesling. It's not an attempt to mirror somebody else's. It's a chance to make your own Riesling with its own local South African feel to it. Yeah, I think for, for, for me, the, the main thing with, with this is not to try and make anything. The, um, the Step Vineyard is really special. I've made the first one in 2012. So in the beginning years of my business, I changed wines like from year to year. We changed a lot. But nowadays, we've got vineyards that sort of almost fixed. So last year, we made like, I think, 47 different wines. But most of them are now vineyards that's in the portfolio from year to year. So it's stuff that we know better and better. And this particular vineyard is, is grows in Elgin, so it's a really good vineyard. It's a combination between two. So there's one that is that grows on a pole, like a stalk by pole king, and then the other one next to it grows on a sort of a trellis vineyard, and it's a combination between the two. And so in 2012, when I made the first one, I literally walked into the vineyard and I tasted the grapes until it tasted fine, and I picked it and we made a wine from it. I mean, the, it, the alcohol was always 14% over 14 this year it's 13.5 which is to the lower end um but most of the years it's slightly higher and and i and i i realized that that we live in south africa we have sunlight we have lots of sunlight we've got higher temperatures it's going to show in the wine it's just going to show so so obviously I, um i don't i don't want people if you put this wine in a reasoning bottle people is going to look at people look at the bottle they're going to say that's a reasoning I'm going to compare it to Germany, and I never wanted that. So I put it in a burgundy bottle uh, so people can just be open-minded. Ooh. Have we lost you there for a moment, Mr. Volsa? Have we got you back there, Peter? Yes, I'm here. Can you see me? Ah. There we go. We just lost you for, for just a moment. We got the majority of that, though. Uh, I, I want to go back to a statistic you gave me. 47 wines you're making 47 different wines in one year yeah, last year we released 47 i think yeah close to that <laughs> how, how on earth do you manage to make that number of wines and keep a keep an eye on everything and see how it's going uh it's it's sort of what we do now that's I think it was a stupid business model because it's a lot of work um, I think if it, it started off uh, uh, what we did and then we changed and we we, we're not bound to a specific area. I don't own any vineyards. So we started working in so many different areas. So by the time I liked the one thing, I liked 10 other stuff. So we just started to make everything. Um, yeah. So it wasn't planned. <laughs> well, you've got, a, you've got a lot of fans for what you do do, and I see a number of them are with us. Uh, uh, Daryl Balfour, good evening, Dan, Duncan and Peter. Surf no good this evening. Uh, Winemaking surfers are out in force tonight. Uh, Angelique Kubalakis, my favorite show. Angelique, thank you very much. Keith Magoli saying uh, hello to Dan and the guest. The guest would be Peter Volser, the maverick winemaker from Blank Bottle. Karen Bothmer, pick me, pick me, pick me. I think she wants to go to uh, go and stay at Bartony for that competition. Uh, Bruce Fillion, Blank Bottle, amazing wines, retirement at 65, my best. Uh, Daryl Balfour says he's drinking a nothing to declare right now. Uh, and then Bruce, uh, Bruce making a point uh, of that's why it's so hard to buy some of each. Uh, if you're making 47 different wines, how many bottles of each are we looking at? Is it a barrel here, a barrel there? Is that about it? Well, I, we do in a year about 100,000 bottles. So it uh, depends from wine to wine. Certain vineyards are limited. Like this is only, this is a very small vineyard, half of the, the wine. So it's going to be a small production. Um, but we, our biggest production is close to 10,000 bottles for Moment of Silence, which is our, this is probably the one that we can make the most of because we have, it's a big blend and there's plenty of vineyards that go in there. And then the smallest one we make is from one row of Pinot Noir on the Sierras Mountains, which is, I think, uh, 54 liters I make from that. Um, but that 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 is that project's done now. So anything in between, but altogether like uh, between eighty and hundred thousand bottles a year. 
<laughs> there are not many winemakers you'd find who'd go out of their way to make 54 liters of a single wine as one of the 47 that they made. But that is what makes this wine so original, as does the labels, as we made very clear, the stories behind them as well. Let's go on to the second wine. And, and this story, uh, when I read it for the first time and I just had the first line, I thought, oh, my goodness, I've got a homicidal maniac on my wine show. I can't possibly do this. Uh, and then, of course, I read the full story and realized exactly what it had. But uh, uh, talk us through, if you will, Mr. Balsa, uh, the evening when you killed your son with a spade and buried him. <laughs> so just to explain, like, like uh, it's not always this case. Most of my wines has got very particular vineyard stories to it. But sometimes there's something happens which is just really amazing and, and you've got to capture that and you've got to, it's almost like you wanted to remember it for the rest of your life. And this is, this is one of them. Um, so uh, the one is called Familien Wirt, and it's the first one I made in 2013. So it was around 2014, I bought a house in the Strand, so I live really close to the beach now. And all the properties in this, this section of the Strand is basically been built on sand dunes, so it's pure white sand underneath your soil. So what I did is when I when I moved in here, um, in this property, there's lots of sort of black soil driven in for gardening purposes. So I wanted to build a sand pit for my kids. So I dug a big hole in the property, about four meters wide, let's say a meter, uh, um, uh, four meters in length, a meter wide, and about this deep. So I had this huge hole on my property, and um, but there was only black soil there. So I know my neighbors have a really big property. It's about seven plots all together. And he sold it to someone else, which I didn't know at the time. And it was in that time where, um, before they took a sort of ownership. So the, 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 the site was um, sort of open. No one lived there. The garden was overgrown. And he had this really big lawn. So I knew under his grass there will be pure white sand. So I took my wheelbarrow on a Saturday. And I didn't ask permission, so I went all around here. I went into his property and I dug up little pieces of grass, like little blocks of grass, uh, sort of the size of a small grave. <clears throat> and then I took the grass out and I, and I had pure white sand. So I took the sand out, <clears throat> sorry, and I, I put the sand on my wheelbarrow and I brought it all the way to my property. I chucked it into my hole, took uh, my black soil and I took it to his property. So I had end of the day, I had a big hole in this white sand on his property with a heap of black soil next to it. So um, it was started to get dark. So it was, <clears throat> it was about to be dark. And I was standing <clears throat> there with my son. And I asked uh, Luca, I said, come, Luca, I'm going to take you. I'm going to throw you into this hole. And I'm going to cover you with soil. So like when you play at the beach, you put your friend into the sand and you cover him up until here. But he was very small. So when I threw him into this hole, he, he disappeared completely. And I took uh, soil and I started covering the soil all around him. And I fought this hole up until here. And um, But the moment I took my son and I threw him into this hole, there was kids playing in the street. And they were, they were about 16 years old. And one of the kids, they climbed into the tree and they looked over the wall. The moment he looked over the wall. I was walking towards my son with the spade, and I took him and I threw him to this hole. So this kid was thinking on this vacant property, overgrown garden. This guy killed his, this boy with a spade, and he's burying him in this hole. So he and his friends watched me as I covered my son with soil. Um, they ran home. When they left, well, I took my son up the hole and I put some soil into the hole. I compacted the ground and I put these blocks of grass neatly back into the hole and I sprayed a little bit of sand over it so no one could see I was there. And I left. The kids arrived home at the night and they, they, were, they freaked out because they told their mom that this guy killed a boy with a spade and busy burying him. And uh, the next morning, the, the, the woman with their kids came out to the property. And I remember I was home and I looked, there was some commotion next door. And they came out and they saw this suspicious hole on this vacant property. And they phoned the police. The police came out. Um, they said, this is a crime scene. They took these yellow uh, crime scene ribbons and they wrapped it around the whole property. That was on the Sunday. Now, to dig up a body is not that simple. You have to get permission from whoever. So the, the police uh, put a guard at the, at the grave, you want to call it that. And um, the whole Saturday, Sunday, this guy was watching this little grave. 
And um, I didn't see anything. I didn't even see the, the ribbon around the property. I just didn't look in that much detail. And the Monday came. So the Monday afternoon I was at home and there was like, I don't know how many policemen outside. So my friend phoned me and said, Peter, there's a problem. There's lots of police outside your house. So I went out. They told me there's this murder next door. Guy killed a boy. And I went around and, um, and I met this inspector guy. And he was telling me, and I said to him, listen, I'm the neighbor. Maybe I've seen something. Uh, he said, I said, what happened? He said, no, there was a murder. It happened. I said, when did it happen? He said, no, it happened Saturday. And I was thinking, oh, my goodness, that I was there Saturday. I said, but, but where did it happen? He said, where these police dogs were sniffing up and down. That's where the guy buried him. So I said, listen, I think it was me. So obviously I had some explaining to do, but it was just this, this huge misunderstanding. And I thought I, I've got this blend of Grenache, Pinot Noir, Cinso, which I really like, but there's no particular vignette story behind it. It's a bit of a weird combination. And I thought, okay, goodness, if this thing happened, I, I would like to sort of remember that for the rest of my life. I called the wine Familie Moort, and, and that is Familie Moort. <laughs> it is a story that only Peter Volser could A, be involved with and B, translate into a bottle of wine. It's a terrific story. And that, uh, as you can see from the label, that is the newspaper cutting uh, from the Argus when uh, they thought that Peter Volser had buried his own child in the next door neighbor's garden. Look, I think most of us parents have thought about doing something similar. We've never actually done it though. I'm glad you didn't either. Uh, the, the, the wine has to be something quite impressive to match up to such a story, Peter. You touched very quickly on what it is. And I know some, some Elgin Pinot Noir in here. I think you said some Grenache as well. Just a, a real study in lightness and, and some and beautiful red fruit. Yeah, um, I, I mean, uh, it's not, it's in the cellar, sometimes you've got stuff that just wants to be blended together. So it's not, it was never the plan to make a, a Grenache a Pinot Senso a blend. But when you taste the wines, you taste the individual components. The Grenache is from, from Wellington, the, uh, the Pinot is from Elgin, and the, uh, the Senso is from the Bredekloof. If you taste those wines individually, they there's a, a similar thread running through all these wines. And if you start working on a blend, they just work together. So, um, so that's also part of the reason why there was no particular solid story um, behind the vineyard itself. And that's why Familie worked, worked well there. Oh, great story on so many levels. As a few people point out, Karen Botma, what a brilliant story. Uh, Keith Magoli, amazing story, Peter. So lots of people celebrating those. Uh, and then uh, as well as Karen and Keith, uh, just a couple of other comments coming in. Uh, Scott Stapelberg, who generally only drinks stuff if it's got Pinotage in, uh, says he's never tried them. Where can I get hold of some? And a very quick response coming in from Christine at Great Domains, who's popped her information in there. She runs it. And then this older guy with a beard called Derek uh, takes all the credit. Uh, speaking of Derek, uh, he uh, uh, mentions he's got the wine. He also asks a question, though. Uh, the Family Mord now a non-vintage, says Derek Kilpin. Why is that? Ah, oh, just because it worked. No, it's, it's a, it's a comment. <laughs> it is just... The year, uh, see, see, that's the thing with Family Mort. Family Mort is not, it's not a, it's not a single vignette. It's, it's something that you can play it around a bit, just because the story is a bit removed from the wine. And this year, it's always been a single uh, vintage. But this year, we just felt that we needed some little bit more depth coming from from the Grenache. And the previous year's Grenache just had a little bit more depth. So that's why we brought in a little bit of that. And then again, I mean, if you're going according to um, to the law, you are allowed to blend something from a previous vintage into it and not actually saying it on the label if it's not as much. But uh, we feel like we, we're trying to be as honest as possible with what we do. And if we bring in a little bit from a different vintage, we try and, and show it on the label as well. Perfect explanation. One more comment. You've got another fan out there, somebody I think you know rather well, Jasper Wickens saying hello and uh, – I think you can see from his line there exactly the esteem in which he holds you. Uh, Peter, I feel like we should have you on once a week to tell stories from your wine. Uh, so let's definitely have you back on again soon uh, because they are so terrific. The artwork is great, uh, but far more importantly, the narrative behind each of them 
which is so entertaining and backed up by some terrific wine, which you need to, especially after such great stories. You want something special inside, and that's something that you consistently deliver. So big thank you for being with us today, for bringing back the blank bottle to Dan Really Likes Wine, and we look forward to having you back on the show again soon. Cheers. Thank you. Peter Valls, uh, the man behind Blank Bottle with his uh, family mood based on the time the police thought he'd killed and buried his son. How many people have a story like that to throw back on? And then the Hinterhofkabuff, the German word for a ramshackle building out the back of your house, which a German journalist in 2010 out watching the World Cup turned into an article that inspired that particular bottle of Riesling. So some terrific wine to get us going. One of the great characters of the South African wine industry. And a big thank you to Christine and her assistant, Derek at Great Domains, uh, for bringing along Peter, but also for bringing back somebody we had on the show not that long ago. The wines of Duncan Savage have become very, very established in a very short space of time. Initially, Duncan was the man behind Cape Point Vineyards, making some terrific wine, and not just Sauvignon Blanc. And he had the winemaking world at his feet. He could have done many, many, many things. So what did he opt to do? Uh, he rented out what was pretty much an unused garage in Woodstock and decided that would be the perfect home to make great wine. Well, it proved to be an inspired decision because when the sales opened last week for the new vintages, they pretty much sold out in the next few days. Such is the clamor and acclaim around the wines of Duncan Savage. So let's bring the bearded surfing winemaking model into the show and say good evening, Duncan Savage. How's it, Dan? How's it going, man? I can indeed. A warm welcome. Good to see you. Welcome back, Duncan. Yeah, Leka. Nice to nice to be on the show again, Dan. Good to see your face. I just <laughs> when we before we start, I just want to clear something up. You know, there's a couple of dodgy areas in Cape Town, and, and Woodstock's one of them. We're in Salt River. We better better known as the Salt Riviera. It's a it's a little bit more swanky than Woodstock. So I just wanted to clear that one up. All right. I'm trying to think of a comparison there. That's kind of um. No, let's, uh, let's leave it there before I get into trouble. But uh, OK, so my apologies. Well, let's actually show everybody first up. I think uh, I think we've got a photo of the Salt Riviera, the wine making paradise. Uh, so there we go. I mean, basically, I think, Duncan, you, uh, you say to yourself, if I'm going to be making wine, I need somewhere that's on a Golden Arrow bus route. I think that's probably your most important point of reference. <laughs> No, look, Dan. It's um, it's actually such an epic place. So we've, uh, you know, I would have, I had this. Uh, we all still, I think, South Africans. I've said this to so many people before. We like really dream about owning a piece of land, and um, I don't own a piece of land. Obviously, I own two little sections of a building in 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 Soul Trevor. But for us as a business, it was kind of like what made sense at the time. You know, you you've just sort of embarked on this emotional roller coaster of a journey of wanting to build your own wine business, and it's um. You know, you kind of, you, there's no manual for that sort of stuff. You know, it's quite tricky, as you know, but any business, I suppose. But it just seemed like a lack of, you know, I, I, I bought a place that had been kind of developed by another guy. And um, and it was awesome. It seemed like a great opportunity and, and something which for me at the time was um, was lacking. And obviously that neck of the woods is, is crawling with hipsters who like to drink wine. So it sounded like a good thing to do. So you grew your beard and you moved in and you've done incredibly well since then. Was there a moment, I think it was 2013 when you started out, was there ever a moment where you thought, what on earth have I done? I had a brilliant job at Cape Point. I was making wine, people were drinking all over the world. And yet now I've made this crazy decision. Did you ever have any second thoughts or was it uh, best foot forward the whole way? No, look, I think it's... Um... Yeah, you know, you always there's times every year and whatever week we maybe you have a bit of a rough one and you think, oh yes, maybe we shouldn't have done this. But at the end of the day, you know, you've we've embarked on a on a journey that's there's there's uh, like with anything. I mean, tricky times. And the thing about the wine industry is it's such an emotional thing. Like I said, that you 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 become so invested in what you're doing. You become so invested in the vineyards you work with, the wines you make. I mean, most of it is. If you if you look at it from a business point of view, most of what we do makes no sense at all. Um, you know, there's a barrel that 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 has no relevance in your range, but it tastes good. So you develop a label around it. You spend so much money trying to get that thing into bottle. You actually make no money, like we've done with our sweet wine. But that's it's lacquer to do. And if you can make business sense out of some of the other things you do around it, then it's fantastic. So 
I have to say, I think that it was the best move ever. I mean, Cape Point was great for me. I had this um, this golden pathway open up for me and that when I was at Elsenburg, my biggest fear was that I was going to get a job in a place like Pilbach that's far from the beach. So getting a job at Cape Point was just amazingly epic. And, um, you know, I had to I had to work. It was actually quite tough because I had to work most days watching these cooking waves down in Norton. And I was working for a boss at the time, so I couldn't just disappear whenever I wanted to. But, it, you know, it was an amazing school. And, and you know, you learn about the whole thing and, and get going and then embarking on, on Savage when we did. The time was right. So it was it was awesome. Your reference to surfing and your love thereof probably explains the geographic diversity of where you source your grapes from. Basically, anywhere that has a decent uh, decent wave, there's a nearby vineyard that Duncan has found. Uh, in, in terms of that, it's uh, the, the process, because to me it's fascinating, uh, this new wave of winemakers, or new-ish, who don't necessarily have to have their own estate, have their own specific vineyards. You're wandering around, you're finding a parcel here, you're finding a bit of land there, trying some grapes. Is that one of the really exciting parts of the journey that you take each year, discovering how vineyards you've used before are going in a new vintage or how something brand new might add to your range? You know, look, I mean, it's, um, we stick to the same vineyards every year. In the beginning, it wasn't the case because we, you know, you, you chop and change a little bit to try and figure things out because you kind of, you know, as, as a winemaker, you go into a place and you think, oh, this vineyard looks fantastic, but the wine might not be fantastic. So, you know, you, you, you kind of have to experiment a little bit in the beginning, but, you know, now, you know, we're almost 10 years down the track and, um, and everything is kind of, it's the same vineyards every year. And all those wines now are molded around specific vineyards, the story, the soil, you know, the, there's so much that goes into it. And a lot of it as well, the farmer, you know, the people we deal with. I think that's the coolest thing about the industry is we, it's such a, such a people industry. I don't know, that doesn't, that's not really good English. But I mean, you know what I mean? It's just like, it's such a sociable, sociable thing. And I was actually saying to some Oaks the other day, you know, even if you're a doers, if you drink a little bit of wine, you, you become lacquer. And I think that the more wine you drink, the more lacquer you actually become. And, and I think that's the case for everyone, you know, whether you're involved in the industry, the farmers, the people we sell wine to all the time, there's this whole journey you go on that, that just is, is amazing. And, and, it's, um, and, and all of that becomes part of those wines in your range, I think. It's a, it's a, it's a really holistic thing in many ways. As you can see from Duncan's philosophy, Salt River is very close to observatory and uh, uh, that does filter through. Uh, I'd love to have you and Martin Lumprecht on the show together. I think the shared philosophy would be incredibly entertaining. Uh, also very entertaining, Duncan, the names of the wine that you have. We're going to be trying the Follow the Line Cinso. In fact, you've got a fan therein. Savage Follow the Line Cinso is fabulous, says Helen Nickel, who happens to be my mother and is a very big fan of your wine. In fact, she normally drinks it out of the bottle. Uh, that's her preferred yeah. approach. Um, so we'll try that in just a moment and find out why it's called Follow the Line. But I have a question I'm not sure I can ask. Well, I'll ask it anyway. I'm not sure I can get the answer. Uh, Daryl Balfour, please ask Duncan for the story behind Not Tonight Josephine if it's suitable for Dan's audience. Yeah, Daryl. No, it's actually not such a bad story. To be honest, I was um, I couldn't think of a bloody name. All of the names are so there's so much relevance towards what we do, you know, with all the vineyards. And um, and what happened with that one, it took about six months. We we didn't have a name, and I, I just Googled these random sayings and things like that. And I stumbled across this not tonight, Josephine. And I thought, firstly, it sounds amazing. Um, secondly, you know, I, I, I looked read, I clicked on it and read up about the story of Albis Napoleon and Josephine. And I thought, you know, it's not often that a man says no. So I thought that was already fairly interesting. And then I thought the words I normally hear is from my wife, not tonight, Duncan. So I thought not tonight, Josephine had a little bit of relevance and it was a cool name. And it's got no relevance to the vineyard. It's just a really, really cool name. <laughs> it is indeed. It's a, it's a lot of fun and there's a line of fun that runs through. I think everything you do is you make very, very clear, but particularly the wine. And let's start with the first of the two that we have to drink. And this is uh, these are from the new releases. This is the Savage White. And you can see from the label, it's a, a wonderfully clear and uh, and striking label of uh, of the, uh, the the white blend. Uh, talk us through this. Uh, I think it's the 2019, mm. if I'm not mistaken, is indeed. Uh, talk us through the 2019, what we're drinking and what makes this particular year stand out. 
Yeah, Dan, you know, when we kicked off with the business, the, the plan was to make two wines and now we make eight. So the, we, we kind of lost our focus a little bit. But um, it's all been part of the journey, which has been great. And the white is, um, you know, having my having cut my teeth on on, on maritime serving with Cape Point, we, we kind of wanted to, you know, carry on on that that track with a bit of Sauvignon. So Savage White started as a as a Sauvignon semi or blend. And we we tweaked it in, in, in 2015 by introducing a bit of Shannon into the wine. And the idea with the Shannon was kind of just to to bring in a bit of texture. We were working, we were experimenting with so many different Shannon vineyards at the time. And we've now settled into the one that's that's um, never been asked to dance, which is our Shannon we make uh, from a single vineyard in Paul. But that kind of journey of working through all those different Shannon vineyards was super cool where we were able to blend in little bits and pieces into to Savage White to try to, you know, figure out where we were going. And, and in all those experimental blends, we really liked the textural dimension it brought to the wine. So the, the base of that wine, the Sauvignon component, which is, is in, the, in the 19, just over 60%. So it's normally sort of 50% to two thirds of the wine. It's um, Johann Rupert's property in a place called Kaimanschat. And, uh, you know, Johan's got a spare bit of change. So I think that, um, you know, where everyone plants apples generally because it's very profitable, Johan can afford to have a, a few vines. And, um, and it's, a, it's an amazing place. If you haven't been to Kaimanschat before, it's just this incredible amphitheater of mountains, really cool climate, um, and just makes these beautiful, beautiful Sauvignon um, wines, you know. And, and we just decided that, that, you know, the acidity from that Sauvignon was so piercing, so linear, so focused that we needed to blend in some Semiel. So we found some Semiel down at a farm uh, down the road from Kaimanschat uh, in Valiersdorp, a farm by the name of Redain. And uh, it's these lacquer, you know, there's this really old semiol vineyard on Redain. It's 54 years old. Unfortunately, that's now been sacrificed for apples. So we're working with a younger vineyard. I say younger, it's just under 30 years of age. But it's a really beautiful little semiol vineyard in, in, in quite two very sort of contrasting growing conditions. You know, one's quite sandy, one's got a lot of clay in the soil, um, sandier where the semiol is. But it just works together. And then we just found that addition of that little bit of shin and and in the 19, it's a bit of Shannon from the Never Been Asked to Dance vineyard. It just gives it a little bit of texture and just rounds off the wine beautifully. So it's, you know, it's a wine which you're going to, I think, drinks really nicely now. It's going to continue drinking nicely over the next, I'd say, five years, longer with interest. Um, it's very much more of a fuller style of food wine. You know, you can sit at the pool on the deck chair and smash a couple of bottles if you want to. But I think it cries out for a little bit of food and, and, uh, and uh, yeah, just to, a little bit of thought. Yeah, I, I love the sense of invention to this because normally uh, if you were blending a Sauvignon, we'd see some semiol. that's perfectly usual. Uh, finding Shannon in it, not something that's quite so usual. And it's, it's almost Sauvignon Blanc with a crunch. Uh, and that's exactly what you're saying about some great food. So uh, I'll look forward to putting that to the test uh, when I'm next down in Salt Riviera and can maybe challenge you to find uh, the right roti uh, to go with this. A uh, number of fans uh, checking. Yes, Gatsby, wrong part of town. Gatsby, Gatsby indeed. I see uh, Josephine Prier as we go back to the uh, the previous wine's name. Thank you, Duncan, for choosing Josephine. Love the name. Not tonight, Josephine. Must on my next visit to South Africa find this bottle uh, or just find Duncan either way. Uh, and then uh, Derek Kilpin is a poet, really. Tagline for Savage Wines, drink more wine, don't be a doer, be lacquer. I think that's got marketing gold written all over it. And uh, Keith Magoli in a similar sphere for the next label, Duncan, Durst Lacquer Wine. Um, I think Durst Wine might exist already, and it's just generally well known for giving you a little mighty headache. Um, before we go on to the second wine, uh, this is a tasting. It's glorious. It's part of the reason why the, uh, the online frenzy last week when you released your wines was quite so eye-catching. Uh, the just people everywhere desperate to get hold of your wine. It must be enormously rewarding to see that. Does it still take you a little bit by surprise, though, that people are queuing up on the Internet so religiously to try and get hold of whatever they can from the latest Savage releases? Yeah, listen, it's fantastic. I don't know what's wrong with all of them, but uh, no, it's, it really is amazing. Hey, Dan, we've had the response has been incredible. You know, we've always done had a great response to the wines, and this year has just been off the charts. We had, you know, um, internationally, I think there's been a, a phenomenal Drink South Africa campaign, which has been great. So we've seen a lot of our, 
our export guys wanting to increase volumes and, and, and really being keen to get behind brand South Africa. You know, there's guys that have gotten behind a few interesting brands over time, but getting behind brand South Africa as a whole has been, has been awesome, I think. You know, and then the local market, I mean, the guys are super keen, hey? Um, it's fantastic. Long may it last. Uh, you know, we're going to continue. It ena enables us to do cool things. The quicker we sell our wine, the more time I can spend in the vineyards, um, which is amazing. And uh, and then, you know, the, the the kind of thing snowballs. You know, we get to a point where we get to know the vineyards so much better that the quality just every year on year just improves. And um, and we've also tried to offer, you know, there's been a lot of guys who've supported us from day one and really looked after us in terms of, you know, private customers and guys like Derek and them at, at Great Domains. You know, it's 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 fantastic. It's been awesome. We can't complain. I see. I uh, got yet another fan, Stephanie Nodier, simple rock star, Duncan Savage. Uh, you're not alone in that particular view. And then I've got a private message come through, so it won't show up on the screen. Uh, I'm not sure if it's the same person, but also from a Derek Kilpin asking, "Would you consider doing a bubbles for my engagement party later this year?" <laughs> Uh, for Mr. Kilpin, we'll do anything. Eh? As long as I'm invited. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm into, I like it. <laughs> All right. One wine down and a terrific wine. And uh, again, like so many of our white blends, it's the do I drink it now or do I manage to hang on to it a little longer? Uh, I'll do my best to do the latter, but can't promise. Second wine we have today, and this is the one we've mentioned several times, the one my mother enjoys so much. Uh, in fact, I think it's one of her preferred breakfast wines. And that is the uh, uh, the follow the line Cinso. Uh, before we try the wine, you'll be able to see from the image, uh, telegraph pole, small bird on. Where does this particular name come from? Yeah, that was the start of, of the white labels. You know, Dan, we, we, when we came out with Savage Red and White, you know, I lay in bed one night and I thought, yes, our names are so bloody unimaginative. You know, at least it's a good surname, but Red and White, yeah, it wasn't, wasn't too sharp in the beginning. We had to up the game a little bit. And then I, I got I heard about this little Cinso vineyard in, in, in a place called Darling, which as you rightly pointed out, it's quite close to the sea. You know, as we like to say, maritime and mineral uh, in the flavor spectrum. But it's um, you know, this I, I headed down to this little property along a dirt road, this whole mix of dirt roads. It's a servitude running through someone else's property to get to this farm. And um, and I got lost. And you know, when a when a Soti is going off to to a, a guy that farms with mostly sheep and wheat. You know, you, you, you're going to cop a bit of flack when you get there. And uh, I phoned Booty, who was the, the guy, um, uh, the farmer who I was dealing with. Phoned him the first time, and he was a little bit suspicious about this English oak who wants to come and check out his farm. And, um, and then he gave me directions, and I carried on the, the track. Got lost. Second phone call starts to, you can hear the, the irritation in his voice. Third phone call, just silence. And then I hear Duncan, call the fucking telephone line, which means follow the effing telephone line. I know it's, it means the same in both languages, but I, that was the story essentially. And I stopped the car. I took a photo of the telephone pole that was next to me. Um, I went to Booty. It, you know, he was very still. You know, it wasn't a very long visit. And uh, and then I went off. You know, you know, a couple of months later, I went and Booty and I became good mates. And you know, with these oaks, the, the, the farmers. You know, we've got some amazing people in this country. Eh? These these farmers, like Booty, we would. Um, what started with these quick visits, I'd pop in, how's it putty, our vineyard's looking lacquer, uh, what are we going to do now, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, to uh, putty, I'm coming, boss, I've got like half an hour just to pop in quickly, you know, you get there, and he's like, oh, Duncan, we've got to just check this, and listen, I just, I lit a fire before you came, we're going to quickly just do one piece of buri, and then one piece of buri turned into a couple of beers, a couple of bottles of wine, and then you end up sleeping over, and that was like the hospitality, hospitality and just the, the, the feeling in general of what we experienced with this property. And it, you know, with Booty aside, it, it happened to have some really amazing, amazing Cinso. So there's this, there's the, a 38 year old Cinso vineyard. So one of Peter's wines, actually, I work quite a bit with Peter with that side. He's got a wine that comes from uh, a Cinso vineyard on that property too. And then my vineyard's just across the way. And um, it's beautiful. 38 years old, you know, in the old days, the guys were pruning for production. So you've got slightly longer canes. And, a, and a, you know, when you prune for production, so you've got a vine that's a little bit higher out the ground. It's all dryland bush vines. And these these little vines, you know, they've been beaten by the southeaster of the cold Atlantic for a number of years. So it looks like they're crawling up the hill. Um, it's really a beautiful site in winter. But one of the things 
is um, you know we've we've uh, we've kind of had a, a new take on the block to try and figure out because you can imagine with all that wind and all those vines getting sort of blown up the hill, all the canopy is going to one side. So we've got a new philosophy there, and that's bring back the bush and try to get like more vines onto the the wind side of the vine. I said that the other night on a Zoom tasting, and Derek Kilpin obviously took it into the trenches. I mean, it was a very innocent strategy from a vineyard point of view. But Derek, you know, dirty mind, dodgy guy. It, it, Sort of took things a little bit astray but anyway it's tried to to recreate these beautiful old bushes where we get you know more canopy on the wind side and um it's been an amazing journey so it's 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 really been cool and it results in a wine that's you know just got so much purity um uh, so much finesse it's never going to be a big wine you know one can't pick some so you can pick some so 15 alcohol if you want but it's going to be crap so the idea has always been to to try and you know really work with a vineyard and make a wine which suits the site and and not try to extract too much so the wine's always generally quite light quite pure and it's got that real trademark of darling that sort of rose water element you know there's the simso red fruit but that hint of rose water and a lot of people don't think simso is going to develop very much but when you give that wine a bit of time in bottle dan i tell you they become beautiful over five years you know to ten years with longer if they sell it well i don't know and I was chatting to Tego Jacobs and Roland Pinsel earlier on. You've got some of this follow the line on their current Strauss auction that they're putting together. And they were saying exactly that. Uh, we often speak of Cinso of this lightness, and it's something we can drink pretty early on. Uh, but this follow the line is a good example of both Cinso that's got some depth and structure to it beyond those initial uh, light and delicate uh, touches, but also it's wine that can age, that you can keep. It's got a, a longer story than just the first couple of years after it's been made. Yeah, look, I mean, I think that's the thing, you know, with, with, with wines, just because it's lighter in style doesn't mean it's not going to develop well. And I think that's something we've learned. I mean, our, our, our maiden vintage of the red is, um, you know, the 2011 red was 12 and a half alcohol. The wine is, was lighter in style. I was quite nervous at the time. Is it going to work? You know, I was an oak that just spent his time making white wine and had a crash course from one or two mates in the bucky, basically, how to make red wine. And, um, you know, that Savage Red 2011, I opened a couple, two bottles over the last two weeks with private clients, and uh, they've just been fantastic. They've still got lots of life left in them. And it's awesome to see, you know, are they going to last? You know, it's, we're not Bordeaux that has the longevity like that, but I think you know, any good South African wine should last a good 10 to 15 years. And it's just, I mean, I think that's at the end of the day, Dan, I mean, not everything is going to age, but I think that's part of the romance of, of, of wine. You know, why we all drink it is, is to to drink it when it's young because obviously it's nice and it makes us feel good and it makes your mates that are dresses be less of a dress but it what it does is that it just it that romance of finding that old cork that you pull that blows your mind and i always say to people it's like gambling because you never forget the times you lose you only remember when you win so you forget all the the wines that are dodgy that you don't that you you you, you that you maybe left for too long but when you pull that great cork and it's really fantastic and it blows your mind it's a game changer. And I think that's one of the great joys of life to be able to do something like that, you know, with good mates and good food. It, it really makes it quite special. You provide terrific wine for a lot of people and some of them are rather high profile in the wine industry. I see Angela Lloyd uh, chipping in. Angela, love to see you. Uh, lovely to see yeah, you watching. Angela. Such a cool guy. Even cooler wines. The latest, knock your socks off. And, uh, and that's shared by many, many people. Probably the only challenge for you now, Duncan, is that you've established in a very short space of time this immense reputation with Savage Wines. You're now up to eight from your originally planned two. All of those are pretty much sold out. What's next for Duncan Savage? Is there ever an idea to, to buy your own vineyards? Uh, how do you see yourself growing and expanding, if indeed you do at all? Are you quite happy as you are and use the spare time to, to go surfing and helping to, to bring back that bush? <laughs> yeah dan look it's um <laughs> it's uh the thing is so i lost my train of thought for a second now you know with the business um with um with savage it's eight wines i think is enough there, there could be an extra one here and there you know for what we want to do but we also need to focus and we need to keep things you know i suppose yeah focus i mean at the end of the day the vineyards we work with are the vineyards we want to work with i i would Give anything to own a piece of ground um, i've looked at a number of pieces of ground i've made an offer on a piece of ground the guy's got developmental rights there so there's not really an option to you know it's too expensive really in terms of what he wants 
Um, obviously, there's a climate here that's that's you know politically that's that's obviously throwing throwing us a few curveballs at this stage, but it's it's the ultimate goal is to you wake up in the morning and go and jump on your nice little John Deere tractor and go and plow your own lands. It would be amazing. I mean, we we have the privilege at the moment of leasing most of the properties we work with, so we farm most of them ourselves. The ones we don't farm, the farmers do the basic actions, and we go in and do everything. It's a great, it's fantastic for the wines, but it's terrible for my surfing time. But it's um, it's it's really, you know, it's so rewarding when you see. Like I always say to people, you you do these quality drives in the cellar, and how do you quantify the improvements? Whereas when you go into the vineyard and you do something like mulching or whatever, in a short space of time, you see this result in front of you, which you then in turn see in the wine very quickly. So very culturally, I mean, the French have been doing it for years and, and, and Europeans in general, we've often had in the past a winemaking focus. And you can see why South African wine's blossoming at the moment because people are getting out of the wineries and they're getting into the vineyards. And it's, it's the most rewarding thing. You know, why would you want to be in a cold, damp place when you can be out in the sun amongst beautiful vines and having a good time? Or on the waves of Greater Salt River. And if you can balance the two, you've got a very happy Duncan Savage. Uh, last question for you before we let you go and watch Kelly Slater YouTube videos well into the night. If there's one vintage of one wine that you've made since you started this burgeoning empire of yours, what's the one that, uh, to quote Angela Lloyd from a moment or two ago, knocks your socks off? Yeah, it's probably if I, I it's quite easy because I just have to look into my Vinatec and see which wine I've got the least of. And it's probably the Follow the Line 2014. Um, you know, the, the 2013 was the first Follow the Line. We made tiny volumes and we put it on the Guild auction. And then the 2014 came along and, and you know, we were still very experimental at that stage, fiddling the whole thing out. We The 2013 hadn't been under the Follow the Line label. So the 14 was the very first one. And that wine is... is you know, I've, I've thrown it blind into a couple of dinners with, with mates from wine regions around the world, and none of them have any frame of reference for where it comes from, what it's about. And when you take people off sides like that, it's quite lacquer. And the wine happens to be fantastic. You've got 2014 Follow the Line. Up. It's, it's a beautiful wine. It's drinking beautifully now. It will age another couple of years. But, you know, well, it's drinking so nicely now. I, I don't know. You know, you don't know where, where the journey is going to take it. But um, yeah, so it's a, and it's also the story with Booty because you know Booty that I mentioned earlier, he passed away two years ago in a car accident. So we became such tight mates, and it's um, it's been awesome. I have to. Can I tell you one other story about Booty, uh, Dan? Are we, are we are running do. out of time? No, please do, please do. Okay, so so Booty, he I've told the story to a few people. It was it's the stuff of legend. You can't drink the stuff, but it's a great story. Um, Booty got so keen on wine that uh, he, he decided to start making some in his garage. But he, he could only get his really cab from his neighbor. Um, he didn't, for some reason, I don't know why he didn't use his own grapes. But um, he decided that Ruby, Ca Ruby Cabernet sounds like a fantastic name for a grape, and that's the grape he's going to make wine from. But he had to first wait till he had picked all his grapes, and then he would pick that Ruby Cabernet. And he left it a little bit long. So this stuff's like 16 alcohols, high octane. But he decided he had heard all about this coffee pinotage thing that was such a craze at one stage. Maybe it still is now. I don't know. But um, it was quite a big thing. And Booty reckoned he chatted to the guys at Darling Cellars about how you make coffee pinotage. And the guy told him, no, wood chips, all this kind of stuff. And Booty thought, yes, that sounds complicated. So Booty thought, bugger this, drove down to Darling, to the town, bought himself a value tin, value packed tin of re-coffee, took it, poured it into the barrel, <laughs> stirred it all up. Fortunately, he, had, he was clever enough to have the control and the experiments. So he kept one barrel without re-coffee and one barrel with re-coffee. But he was so proud of that re-coffee ruby cabinet. Every time we went there, he would pour, you know, your glass. He would pour you the glass that you could see the meniscus right at the top. And uh, and you just, I just didn't have a heart not to drink the stuff. So I'd have to sleep over because I'd be pissed on drinking 16 alcohol um, uh, coffee pinotage. <laughs> But it was hard work. But it just was, you know, the creativity and the stories behind great people. So it was very sad when we lost him. But it's it kind of he lives on in the wine, and 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 it's it's really cool. Well, he clearly left some wonderful memories. Maybe not the best wine ever, but definitely some wonderful memories and celebrated in that follow the line. Uh, Duncan, thank you for joining us today, and congratulations because your sales last week, the excitement. Uh, the interest, uh, a very clear endorsement uh, of just what a, a wonderful impact 
you're having on the industry at the moment. I'm not the only one who thinks so. Uh, a few others there are Jasper Wickens jumping back in. Uh, the Silver Surfer, uh, according to Jasper. And, uh, and not the first time even got the internet in the swat lamp here, Jasper. <laughs> well, that, that came in by fax, but we were able to, <laughs> to pop it up there. Uh, I see, uh, speaking of Silver Surfer, Stephanie Nodea saying, Gone Grey, Duncan, new wine label, Salt and Pepper, perhaps. So uh, there's maybe a, another name for you to uh, to look out for. And uh, Karen Bothma wrapping us up there, loving the stories from Duncan. Can't wait to go get some of his wine. Well, don't be slow about it, Karen, because this wine is disappearing very, very quickly indeed. Uh, Duncan, enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you so much for being with us. Look forward to catching up again soon. And if not before, uh, we'll see you at uh, Derek Kilpin's engagement party and possibly the christening as well. Bloody legend. Thanks, Dan. Thank you for having me. Eh? <laughs> so there yeah. we go. Duncan Savage, just making some absolutely wonderful wine and having such a good time doing it. You cannot ask for more. And one half of a fabulous duo tonight, Peter Valsa, with the stories behind his labels, which we've only just touched on with two of them. I don't think it'll be too long before we see either of our two guests back on the show. So huge thank you to Duncan Savage and to Peter Valsa and to Christine Derrick and the team at Great Domains. All right, that just about wraps us up. A reminder, though, we still have our competition. If you would like to be off to Bartony for a couple of nights and have a fabulous weekend in the Banhock Valley, tasting wine there at Oldenburg and down at Dele Graaf, then you simply need to head over to our Facebook page or the Dan Really Likes Wine Twitter feed and post uh, your favorite dish to have with a bottle of Banhock Cabernet Sauvignon. Make sure you're following all three estates, plus Dan really likes wine on the appropriate platform, be it Twitter or Facebook, and you could win. We'll announce those winners, two of them, one for this prize, one for the case of wine on Thursday's show. Thursday's show will be at Cheetah Plains up in the Kruger National Park. We'll be there with Ranger Buck and looking forward to being out in the Kruger, drinking some great wine up there. And tomorrow, very special edition Put this one in the diary, five o'clock, so usual time, but an unusual day, five o'clock. I will be at Marble and we'll be celebrating a live tasting with David Higgs, Vikas Schumann, Gary Kiriakou, Steve Steinfeld. We'll find him under a table somewhere and drag him along as well, the Joburg foodie. And we'll be celebrating the reopening of one of South Africa's iconic restaurants. And it has become that in just a few short years. Also, if you're not already a member, make sure you do become one of the Pick and Pay Wine Club. Lots of great benefits, including 20% each month of a selection of wines, three times the smart shopper points, free delivery on wine if you're buying online and you go past a certain threshold and the chance to explore some fantastic South African wine. That is what we've done this evening with Duncan Savage and with Peter Valsa and with all of you. So thank you for joining. Thank you for the last comments there from Stephanie, from Keith, uh, from Angelique, from everybody else who's been with us. And we'll see you back tomorrow, five o'clock at Marble for another fabulous tasting. Have a good evening. Goodbye.